Nagim bay. Bay linja na ngay gang ray ngay kamangul ba karangu ngay. Biyang ngay gujag foundation. Gura ngalamang ngay. Guru umang. Ngalamang ang karigong ngay ngurong naya. Ngura daramang ngay mara ngabumarajan ngabumarunong ngurong naya. Daru wulawala. Nali ya, yila, mara ngurunung yagan. Nawe ngalama, nyang dil til New South Wales Parliament ba ngalama nga jilamung, girwa ya kujaga ngai. Kipar ngalin, yaga ngil, girwa yu jirwa, yali nyang, bandini yu nyi barwari yari nung. Girawa ngai ba gamengul ngai. Gamri ngai darwalanga puri ba ngad gayang. Good afternoon, His Excellency the Honourable Andrew Bell, Lieutenant Governor of New South Wales, Honourable Chris Minns, Premier of New South Wales, the Honourable Benjamin Franklin, President of the Legislative Council, Honourable Michael Daly, Attorney General Member for Maroubra, where my community is situated, Government Ministers and Members of Parliament. My open remarks in my language, the Dharawa language translates to, my name is Ray Ingray. I belong to Coastal Sydney and Botany Bay. I'm the Chairperson of the Gujaga Foundation. I'm a resident of La Perouse, and we are gathered on the lands of the family group belonging to Gaddy. I stand here as it's my grandmother's grandmother's country. Our old people lived here as it was their country and their cultural obligation to be here. Today we are gathered to mark the opening of the New South Wales Parliament and I stand here a child of the stingray. Our ontology or our dreaming tells us we come from the stingray. When the scales of the serpent fell off, the stingray grew. I am the stingray. We are the Gamangul. I'm speaking to you in Darawal. Thank you and good luck. We are meeting today on the traditional lands of the Gadigal. I acknowledge them as the custodians and traditional owners of this land. I pay my sincere respects to their elders, past and present. And I extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait people here today. Honourable Members of Parliament, you have been called together to consider proposals for the first session of the 58th Parliament of New South Wales. You will make your deliberations and put forth your arguments in this, the oldest parliament in Australia. The Legislative Council was established 200 years ago by the New South Wales Act 1823. This was our nation's first step towards representative democracy. Next year, we will celebrate the bicentenary of this house as well, I should add, in my other capacity, the bicentenary of the Supreme Court of New South Wales. Much has changed since 1824. At its first sitting, there were only five government officials, all of them men. Today, we are more numerous and more representative of our community. The new cabinet is emblematic of this. For the first time in our history, women make up half of the New South Wales cabinet. But many of our core values remain the same. Over the past 200 years, people from across New South Wales have been drawn to this parliament to serve. They have worked diligently to win the consent of their fellow citizens and to seek out compromise, to hammer out solutions in the real world. And they have done this to make a real and positive difference in the lives of their fellow citizens. 
In earning the trust of your constituents, you have been elected or re-elected to office. You are part of a great democratic tradition. For some, this is your first time in this chamber. You might be giddy with excitement, perhaps a little unsure of the protocol or even how to get around the building. Don't worry, you are welcome here and you'll quickly find your feet. Others are seasoned veterans. Whichever you are, I urge you never to forget the footsteps in which you follow, the trust that has been placed in you, nor the honour it brings. We have in this chamber people of different backgrounds who hold differing views. That is important, it is valuable. It is crucial to ensure that decisions of this parliament reflect the people it represents. Today, it is my great pleasure to speak to the government's program for the 58th term of parliament. Before I do, I commend all of those involved in the transfer of power. This has been no less remarkable for being routine. We have seen established and mature democracies from around the world struggle with this. New South Wales happily has not. This should give us great pride in our Westminster tradition, our institutions, and the people in the, in the people who serve in them. The civility of the election campaign, much commented upon uh, by the media, will also serve you well going forward. A change of government inevitably brings a new focus and priorities. I'm advised that before the 2023 state general election, the government set out its plan for New South Wales based on six major priorities, namely, to reform New South Wales education system, including preschools and TAFE, to repair and rebuild our health system, to increase access to affordable and reliable transport and cap road tolls, to ensure good sustainable housing is attainable for buyers and renters, to end the privatisation of state-owned assets and critical infrastructure while creating a state-owned clean energy corporation, and to build an economy that is resilient and works for people and small businesses. This is the agenda the government put to the people of our state. It is the basis upon which it was elected and the mandate that it carries. Turning to education. The New South Wales government has made education reform a first order priority. This concerns not only parents, students and teachers, but everyone invested in the future of our state. Education is nation building. A recent OECD report noted Australia's high level of teacher attrition as a serious concern. It pointed to high levels of disruption in the classrooms. And it noted a steady decline in our schools across reading, maths and science. As a nation, we face a projected shortfall of 4,100 high school teachers by 2025. Education does not work without passionate and skilled educators. This is why the government is focused on getting qualified teachers into our schools. It will begin by reaching a comprehensive agreement with the Department of Education to reduce teacher workloads and make salaries more competitive. It continues by converting 10,000 temporary teaching roles into permanent positions as well as converting 6,000 temporary teacher support staff roles into permanent positions. This will give teachers the job security they have been asking for to make teaching their life's vocation. And teaching is a vocation. The casualisation of teaching has forced thousands of talented teachers to leave the profession in New South Wales. The government has already taken the first steps towards fulfilling this promise and it is expected that 1,400 teachers will be made permanent by the start of the next school term, with the full 10,000 temporary teaching positions expected to be converted to permanent positions by the start of the next school year. Support staff are the unsung heroes of the school system, staffing the front office, <coughs> looking after students in the sick bay, and ensuring the lawns are mown. For too long, these staff have been employed on year-to-year -year or even term-to-term -term contracts. Temporary positions increase job insecurity, particularly for young staff, making it much more difficult to get finance for a home or a car, 
to lay down roots and to start a family. The government is demonstrating respect for these vital roles by providing staff who have been at the same school for three years with a permanent position. The government is sending a message to all school staff that they are valued and appreciated for the important work they do. We can all, no doubt, recall the name or names of teachers that inspired us at school and had a major impact on our life's trajectory. We can confidently say education is nation building because good teachers make an impression on us early, the citizens of the nation. To help get the right people into classrooms, the government will establish a $20 million innovative teacher training fund. This will support innovative pathways into teaching, such as clinical teaching hubs. These hubs will give on-the-job training by embedding teaching students into schools so that they can gain classroom experience and receive mentorship. The government will also make it easier for people to retrain as teachers midway through their career by expanding weeknight and weekend Master of Teaching courses. All these measures will complement a new $400 million education future fund. The fund will ensure all public schools receive the funding they need to deliver improved student outcomes and ease chronic teacher shortages. Additionally, the government's growth area schools plan will bring new and upgraded schools to high growth areas. To address educational standards, an ongoing targeted literacy and numeracy tutoring program will be established. And in a novel measure, but not one without precedent in other jurisdictions, the government will introduce a ban on mobile phones in all public schools. If we truly are where our attention is, many students might be returning to the classroom for the first time in years. But education does not begin at school, nor does it end there. Research has unequivocally shown the importance of high quality early childhood learning experiences. To ensure all our children receive this head start, the government has committed to delivering 100 public preschools co-located with public primary schools and investing in 50 new and expanded preschools at non-government schools. For school graduates, the government will also focus on vocational education. Successive generations have been made job ready at TAFE the government will support this institution by allocating a minimum of 70% of all skills funding to TAFE. This will provide TAFE with the financial stability it needs. The government will also conduct a comprehensive review of the vocational education system to ensure that it is accessible and up to the task of reskilling the workers of New South Wales. Another priority concerns health care. The government has set out an agenda to ensure that every person in New South Wales can access health care quickly and easily. This is a foundational concern for any government. Our earliest civic buildings were hospitals. When we are sick and when we are afraid, we want the best for ourselves and for our loved ones. During the darkest days of the pandemic, we saw our health care professionals at their very best. But in its wake, New South Wales Health lost 12.6% of its nursing staff in 2021 and 2022, compared to about 7% each year in the preceding three years. A post-pandemic exodus of staff from professions that they love will leave our state uniquely vulnerable and is a wake-up call <coughs> that must be heeded. The government plans to address this in part by removing the cap on the wages of health workers. By removing the wages cap, it is hoped the exodus of healthcare workers can be stemmed while further systemic challenges are addressed. Longer term structural reform also includes introducing minimum safe staffing levels to public hospitals. This will begin in emergency departments and move progressively out into other areas. Just as the government wants teachers to spend more time in their classrooms, it equally wants nurses to spend more time with their patients. The government will hire an additional 1,200 nurses alongside 500 new paramedics in rural and regional areas. Boosting the number of paramedics in rural and regional New South Wales was the very first major health policy announcement the new government made 
intended to reduce the burden of chronic paramedic shortages and ease strain on the fraught rural and regional health system. Paramedics form a critical part of the backbone of our health system. They endure some of the most difficult and dangerous conditions of all frontline workers, and the government is committed to supporting and protecting them. As our community grows, it is important that our health infrastructure continues to expand. Since 2015-2016, New South Wales has lost 365 public hospital beds, while nearly every other state increased their number of beds. Victoria gained 598 and Queensland 1,027. To address this, the government has committed to delivering over 600 hospital beds in Western Sydney, beginning with a 300 bed hospital at Rouse Hill. This will require a $700 million investment to more than double the existing plans. A raft of upgrades uh, has been proposed, including to Canterbury, Fairfield, Mount Druitt and Blacktown hospitals. In our regions, a new Eurobadala hospital will be open to service our growing South Coast community. The government is also committed to building a new public hospital in the Eritropolis, which is expected to be the largest growth area in Sydney over the next two decades. To relieve pressure on our hospitals, the government will also invest $100 million over five years to boost funding to women's health centres across the state. This will help more women to access tailored health services. On the subject of frontline workers, the government has committed to boosting police numbers, particularly in Western Sydney. The New South Wales Police Force has, force has endured an exceptionally challenging few years through bushfire and pandemic. The state's officers deserve our gratitude and continuing support. The government believes that New South Wales should have a transport system where everyone has accessible, affordable, reliable and sustainable transport options available to them. In an election campaign set against a cost of living crisis, the issue of tolls grew in prominence. The government is committed to putting downward pressure on tolls and undertaking a review. This includes a two year cap of $60 a week for Sydney motorists. It also includes ensuring that the Sydney Harbour Bridge and Harbour Tunnel remain in public hands and that money collected on these key public assets will go towards toll relief. The government has promised never to privatise the Sydney Harbour Bridge and Harbour Tunnel. The government has already also commissioned Professor Alan Fells, the former chairman of the ACCC, to lead an overhaul of the toll network. The issue of transport also led to the contest of ideas around privatisation. The government is on the record as opposing the privatisation of bus services. It has committed to ending the privatisation of public transport now and into the future. And it will aim to improve the delivery of bus services by establishing a bus industry task force. This will bring together industry, trade unions and community stakeholders to find solutions, improve service delivery and ensure an end to the privatisation of our public transport. In addition, the government is also looking at expanding the state's manufacturing muscle so that it can build the transport options of the future. Our state has a proud history of domestic manufacturing. Before it was a haven for the arts, carriage works in nearby Redfern was a hub of industry. It was a place where trains were built and innovation, such as the first air conditioned trains, uh, was nurtured. The government plans to start building our public transport fleet locally, starting by building replacements for the ageing Tangara fleet in New South Wales. This will create 1,000 jobs during the design and build phase and many more in terms of ongoing maintenance. Additionally, it will set a target of 50% minimum local content for future rolling stock contracts by the end of its first term. Turning to housing. Housing affordability is also a major issue in our state and as we know, the stakes are high. Somebody said, it's not a house, it's a home. A home implies security and stability. The kind of solid foundation that gives people the confidence to go out and pursue their dreams and weather the storms of life. But how many people in our state are currently living in homes? 
Many of our fellow, fellow citizens currently feel trapped. Buyers face growing mortgage repayments amidst a cost of living crunch. Renters, also facing inflationary pressures, are stuck with too few rentals, too high rents, falling vacancies and rent bidding. The government was elected to tackle housing affordability and to deliver a better and fairer deal for renters. It is a significant challenge, particularly given the significant economic and budgetary challenges of the day, and one without a simple solution. <coughs> the new government is focused on increasing supply, especially in the regions, as well as modernising the laws for renters. It will prioritise build-to-rent programs, beginning with a $30 million pilot program on the south coast. It will also address supply around social housing, requiring a target of 30% affordable, social and universal housing on surplus public land. This will signal to the private sector that constructing new and more diverse neighbourhoods is both achievable and desirable. To help first home buyers access the kind of stability earlier referred to, the government will abolish stamp duty outright for forced first home buyers purchasing a house up to $800,000. For first home buyers purchasing a property up to a million dollars, the government will offer a concessional rate. As more people are choosing or being forced to rent, the rights of renters understandably became an election issue. The government aims to make renting fairer with the appointment of a rental commissioner who will be an advocate and voice for renters. The commissioner will be tasked with identifying barriers to boosting housing supply for renters, identifying the practices and gaps that undermine the rights of renters and gathering data on renting to inform future policy making. The Rental Commissioner will work to create reasonable grounds for ending a lease, ending the practice of no grounds evictions. The Government will also introduce a ban on secret rent bidding so that if renters want to offer more than the listed price, this will have to be disclosed to all applicants who then have the chance to match or better the offer. For renters, moving homes can also cause additional headaches. The new government will ensure renters don't have to set aside extra money while they wait for their bonds to be refunded, with the introduction of the concept of a portable bond scheme. The fifth priority of the government concerns the vexed issue of climate policy and privatisation. Climate change has been called the defining issue of our time, but this is something of a misnomer. It will define other times as well. It will impact the lives of our children and their children. It will challenge future governments in ways that are difficult to predict, let alone to prepare for. So it is important that our policy levers reflect the seriousness of our circumstances. The new government will introduce a bill to legislate the target of net zero carbon emissions by 2050 will also seek to legislate a 50% reduction in carbon emissions from 2005 levels by 2030, just seven years away. To drive the large-scale changes needed to reach net zero, the government will create a new state-owned body, the New South Wales Energy Security Corporation. It will be seeded with a billion-dollar investment from the existing Restart New South Wales Fund with the aim of accelerating investment in renewable energy assets. The corporation will be a linchpin between government and the private sector. With the private sector driving investment in cheaper, cleaner generation like wind and solar, the government aims to ensure energy is available when there is no wind or sun. This includes renewable storage solutions like pumped hydro and community batteries for rooftop solar. These areas are critical to managing the transformation of New South Wales energy system and to providing the reliability the state needs. The government campaigned on a platform of ending the privatisation of state-owned assets. This includes safeguarding the public ownership of Sydney Water and Hunter Water. Sydney Water has provided safe, reliable water supply to Greater Sydney, the Blue Mountains and the Illawarra region for 135 years. Hunter Water has served the community for 130 years. Both have underpinned the growth, health and flourishing of their communities. On a warming planet, maintaining public ownership of the water supply is ever more critical. 
Retaining public ownership will ensure that the water supply remains in the hands of the people of New South Wales while remaining subject to strict pricing rules and legislation, budgetary oversight and reporting requirements. Keeping state assets in public hands will not just protect the community and our state's resilience, it will also benefit the economy. At the July 2021 ACCC annual regulatory conference, the then chair, Rod Sims, said, and I quote, privatising assets without allowing for competition or regulation <coughs> creates private monopolies that raise prices, reduce efficiency and harm the economy. The final priority is around the economy and resilience. COVID was many things, a global pandemic, a public health <coughs> emergency, a stress test on our supply chains and just in case inventory methods. It exposed the fragility of our systems. Suddenly, when we needed things that we didn't produce locally, we couldn't always get them. This ranged from the mild, mildly annoying, like stationary, to the generally li gen genuinely life-threatening, like vaccines. Or when we could get certain items, their cost was prohibitively expensive. The lesson the government took is that in an uncertain world, we need to scale up investment in our domestic manufacturing capacity and better support local industries. New South Wales has a $33 billion manufacturing industry spread across more than 26,000 businesses. It employs a quarter of a million people. At the heart of the plan is a commitment to train and skill up the next generation of high paid, highly skilled workers who will meet the needs of our people in good times and bad and literally build a better state for future generations. This means prioritising local content and local manufacturing in all government contracts. I've mentioned that this will begin with the next fleet of, fleet of trains to be replaced, the Tangara fleet. <coughs> the government will also set a target of 50% minimum content for future transport rolling stock contracts by the end of its first term. It will also increase tender weightings to 30%, capturing local uh, content, job creation, small business, and ethical supply chains. To oversee this investment and growth of local industries, the government will establish an independent expert body, the New South Wales Jobs First Commission. This will be charged with supporting the growth of local industries and helping local firms in bidding for government tenders. This made in New South Wales policy will be matched by an emphasis on skill building. Local manufacturing will struggle to grow without the highly skilled workers to support it. Western Sydney, the Hunter and Illawarra will benefit from the establishment of TAFE manufacturing centres of excellence. The centres will be able to train, retrain and upskill a thousand apprentices and workers in every year across the three sites. Their focus will be traditional and advanced manufacturing techniques and technologies. At a cost of more than 42 million, the centres will be upgraded to offer mechanical engineering and electrical fitting for free. As New South Wales continues to wrestle with labour and skills shortages, the government will look to Western Sydney and the regions to help deliver the workers of today and tomorrow. By way of conclusion, the government has a clear mandate from the people of New South Wales to invest in those who look after us, teachers, health, and frontline workers. To address the rising costs of living through affordable transport options and sustainable housing. To ensure public owned assets remain in public hands and to address the energy crisis. You, the elected members of the 58th Parliament of New South Wales, have a great responsibility and opportunity before you. You represent a tremendously diverse and industrious people coming from many nations and all walks of life, but working together for the good of all. I began my address by noting the great honour that is bestowed upon all of you. But do not be cowed by this occasion either, or your new roles. Embrace the opportunity of public office. <coughs> Commit yourself wholeheartedly to the task ahead. Work hard to represent and serve the communities that elected you. Political life is not easy. It demands the highest standards of integrity. It calls daily 
for discernment and courage, and on occasion, not a small amount of caffeine. I hope that you will all draw upon the, your reserves so that in four years' time, you are all proud of what you have achieved for the people of New South Wales and also the way in which you have achieved it. I now leave to you the important tasks entrusted to you by the people of New South Wales and wish you the best of luck in the critical work ahead of you. Thank you. Thank you.